Bonjour. Uh, bienvenue sur le podcast. Uh, bonjour, Judah. Merci. So, yeah, thanks again for uh, coming on to the podcast. I'm very grateful um, to have a French teacher who is willing to do this kind of thing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so you are a author, a longtime French speaker, teacher, and um, and also, very interestingly, you come from Eastern Canada, so there's a lot of French over there. So I thought it would be really interesting to have you on the podcast because you could tell us a little bit about what it's like to uh, to uh, learn French over in that part of the country and then start teaching it as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so how long have you been teaching French? Ooh, I would say I've been teaching over 30 years, but French maybe about 18 to 20 years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I teach for a few years and I take a break and come back and yeah. That's cool. Okay. Um, how long have you been speaking it? Oh, since I was in school, you know, back in the last century. <laughs> yeah. I was, I started, I think, in grade four and then went to high school and at university I did the equivalent, equivalent of a French minor. So, but I did about 12 courses, but I didn't do all the official ones for a French major. Yeah. But I did spend uh, some time in Nice in France to, oh, do, cool. um, to do like an immersion for, for a month back in the 1980s. And then I uh, spent a summer in Quebec in the 1990s for a little bit more immersion. So. Cool. Yeah, I'm actually planning on going to uh, Quebec uh, in the summer. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, um, I, I knew about that because you had looked for a reference letter or something. Yeah, like I needed your uh, the signature for uh, my application. Yes. But yeah. unfortunately, it got canceled because of uh, COVID um, this year. But they uh, they so my application got renewed for the 2021 um, oh, good. Season good. instead. So and I didn't even have to do anything. So everything still checks out. I think the yeah. don't need a new signature or anything or anything it's working good so yeah okay so it's looking good for that as long as it doesn't get canceled again which i'm yeah very hopeful for. it will be long yeah. on the other side of covid by then right so. yeah because mm -hmm. yeah i think that's super important to like i've been so interested in learning french and getting as much immersion as i can listening <clears> to like other podcasts and stuff all in french and uh oh, good. um mm -hmm. Uh, just trying to get that immersion, but it's it's never a replacement for being in an environment where it's your day to day life and you have to speak yeah, it exactly. and yeah, just to communicate. Um, yeah, you're so, to. Yeah. Yeah. so where uh, so where did you like take uh, do your French education like um, your original like did you start in uh, like elementary school and then um, yeah. what yeah. I grew up in a town called Placentia in Eastern on the Avalon Peninsula of, of Newfoundland, about, about an hour outside the capital city. And uh, Placentia, as I might have relayed in class over the last couple of years, it actually used to be the French capital of Newfoundland before it became part of Canada, well, a few hundred years ago. So the, there was a lot of French heritage in my hometown, but very few people speak French there now. Like you can probably count them on two hands, right? Yeah, so I was just. I, I did. I did, we didn't have immersion. We just had core French in school. Right? So. Okay. Yeah, I was just about to ask about that. I was gonna say, um, uh, yeah, is there a lot of French around your hometown? But you just answered that. So, um, yeah. so have you found like French to be a, like super practical, like outside of teaching and yeah, outside the classroom? Like, do you find you have to? Yeah. yeah I, I don't get a. I don't get a much of a chance to use it outside the classroom. And um, just when I like when I visit certain parts of Canada that where they speak French, like Quebec, or or if I go to the French islands, Saint Pierre and Miquelon, off the coast of Newfoundland, a chance to practice your French then. But but my three children, they had gone through French immersion in school, so I was able to keep current with it with them when I wasn't teaching it because there were several years when I didn't teach any French. Uh, I was a guidance counselor at the, at the school here for four years. So I did, didn't teach any French then, right? So, so 
so it was it was uh, nice to keep current with the band. But but outside of the classroom now, I don't have any occasion to speak French. Sometimes I'll turn on the French radio in Calgary, the Radio Canada, and uh, just just to keep my ear in tune a little bit, you know. <laughs> to, yeah, like to understand what they're saying. <laughs> yeah. I like listening to the radio in French too. I find it's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. And um, so, yeah. Do, so does your whole family speak French? No, just my three kids. My three kids are fluently bilingual. And my son is just finishing up his degree at university and he did a French major. Oh, wow. So, okay. Yeah. So he's, he's very competent in French and, uh, and he's used his French too. Uh, I mentioned the islands of Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. A couple of summers ago, he went over for... A, mus a musical concert, like a big outdoor event on the islands, and he does some DJing on the side, and uh, he want they wanted him to DJ over there for this concert, and him being able to speak French, going over there really helped them, right? And, and now he's got a lot, he's got a few friends on the French islands, right, that he communicates with regularly, and they yeah. visit each other. He lives in Saint John's, and they visit each other from time to time, so. That's so cool. So he even has some like French work experience. Um, yeah, so. yeah. They they paid him. They paid him in in uh, euros when he went over there, right? And uh, <laughs> over because it's it's European currency there in Saint Pierre and Miquelon, right? They they use they used to use the French francs back in the day, but now it's all euro. But yeah. So he was able to get some employment because he he's fluent in French, right? So. Yeah. So there definitely are the like some massive uh, ups, like uh, benefits to learning it, even if it's like you don't have to. That's always a thing. When you speak English, you never really have to learn another language unless you're living in a region that's that speaks it. But then at the same time, there's like so much opportunity if you do learn one that you can go to those places and then you can get a bunch of really cool jobs. Like that just sounds like the dream, just DJing and like a French speaking like island. Yeah. Yeah. That is unusual for sure. Right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. but, but even my oldest daughter, she's uh, fluent in French as well. And she's a doctor now in St. John's, a resident doctor. And at the hospital, you know, there are, there are occasions when people come in that only speak French, they, especially they come in from the French islands because there is no big hospital on their island, you know, in St. Pierre. So there is a hospital, but they had to go to St. John's for certain surgeries, whatever. So the fact that she can speak French when these people come in, that's really helpful that in her job as a, as a doctor, right? So, yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah definitely. And there are, there are, what I'm trying to say is that you're, you're probably wondering when you're in high school or university, well, I get to use this. I'm living in an Anglophone, Anglophone environment, but, but there are lots of opportunities to use your French outside of the classroom, you know? Yeah, that was a really big thing for me, actually. Um, before grade 10, like in when I was uh, relearning French, actually, because I went to a, a French immersion elementary school and I got quite good in French, but then I lost it all pretty much because um, I just when I started being homeschooled and then yeah. um, I decided to relearn it in uh, junior high yes. and with online courses, but I didn't actually have a class or a teacher or anything. It was um, it was an ADLC course. Okay. Um, but I, I didn't really find it um, super engaging. And it was mostly because I felt like I wanted to regain the skill I'd lost rather than I actually wanted to be able to speak French because mm -hmm. I felt like, and all the times I almost wanted to give up and drop it because I was like, oh, I'm never going to use this skill. And like, mm -hmm. um, when is it going to be practical for me? I'm not looking into any kind of job where I'll need this. But then mm -hmm. going into grade 10 and when I went, started going to your class and then I started getting a lot more interested in it and I had a live class. So that always helps when you're learning a language. Um, and uh, I got really interested in it and I started uh, looking up podcasts in French. Oh. And then, and then I pretty soon I realized that like, even if I like never uh, worked or anything in French or even if I didn't travel, it still opens up like because of the internet today, it opens up a whole new world of mm -hmm. like, of uh, movies and like start watching French movies. That's fun. Like I said, listening to the radio and it's like a whole different perspective. And yeah, it's, it, I found that really interesting. And yeah, and that's, that's the thing about that. Like, cause it, like you said, it opens up a whole new world, right? Another culture, right? Another, you're not just becoming bilingual, you're becoming bicultural, right? So yeah, that's the advantage. <clears throat> so 
Um, uh, so what was what would you say was your was were the highlights of traveling in French speaking uh, areas like uh, Nice and uh, and in Quebec and uh, Saint Pierre and Macallan? Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll just talk about one experience <clears throat> when when I when we went to Quebec, my wife and I and our, I just mentioned my son who was just a baby at the time, and I think he was I think he was like two years old and. And starting to walk and we go through a, excuse me go through a mall in Quebec City and my son as a typical two-year-old was always wanted to touch everything in the stores and and uh, and then one of the ladies in one of the stores says oh say say monsieur two shot two shot two right? so that's what she called my son monsieur two shot two I thought that was pretty cool that expression right and uh, and so that was an interesting experience being in that francophone culture like you know that sound is so nice you know what she said right and yeah that's such a ring to it you know that you there wouldn't wouldn't be the same thing in english oh look at look at your son he's touching everything you know? yeah. like doesn't sound the same right but miss your two shot too like, that sounds really cool yeah it's that's pretty yeah. cool to get a yeah. french nickname <laughs> yeah that's and, right. uh, We've often we've mentioned that to our son Jeffrey a few times over the years, right? And, yeah. Like he doesn't recall it obviously when he was two years old, but yeah, uh, I'd, I'd say one of my favorite things actually to learn in French are all the idioms and expressions. So yeah. they make no sense in English. Like no, <clears throat> no, you can't, like uh, you can't translate it word for word, right? No, no. Uh, like uh, there's what this one kind of funny one that I learned that they use in France apparently, and it's um. So when you do something that's, you accomplish something really easy. Um, I actually learned this in another podcast, but when you accomplish something really easy, say you're playing soccer and you you uh, score a goal and you're like, well, I could do that with my fingers and my nose. You say, uh, les doigts dans le nez. So it's like, oh. <laughs> I could do that, les doigts dans le nez. So it's oh, okay. That's, like, that's so easy. I could do it with like my fingers shoved up my nose and it's a little weird. Okay. But... <laughs> That's cool. I've, I've never heard that before. Right? But, I hadn't either. And I've never yeah, heard it actually it used. Water. So I don't know how useful it is. <laughs> yeah. But, but it's an interesting idiom, like you said, right? Yeah. And we wouldn't use, we wouldn't use in English as much, right? Or at all. Either, right? but, yeah. It just sounds weird, <laughs> but not to the French. But in, in French, yeah. yeah. I guess conversely, some of the things we say in English would sound, or idioms would sound strange to French too, right? Yeah. yeah. Shake a leg or whatever. Yeah, yeah. So or, or like break, break a leg, like have success yeah. like, with your performance. Oh, go break a leg. Like, what do you mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. You want me to physically hurt myself? <laughs> yeah. Um, so what made you really interested in teaching French? Uh, I just like the language, you know, and I like the fact that I grew up in a French, a former French town and and I just had to go like to to the French fort that was there, and I'd walk in there like when I was a teenager and see all the French soldiers' uniforms from the 1600s in this this big building like overlooking the ocean, and that was their fortress. But th they still have that all intact today, right? Not not the whole fortress, but they have a national historic site there. So I got intrigued by French then, just seeing things like that, and. Uh, and I, I just had an interest in it and studied at university. And I, I kind of I kind of wish I had done more with my French. Like I kind of branched off into, I did a major in religious studies. I've taught a lot of English over the, I did a lot of English courses. And I've kind of got into different areas. But I, I kind of, sometimes when I think about it, I, I kind of wish I, well, I probably should have done a little bit more with my French, you know, and spent a little bit more time in a Francophone environment, right? And because yeah. as you said, you know, yeah, when I was in Quebec that summer, when I left Quebec City, I was really, my French was really strong. When I left Nice that, after that summer, my French was really strong. But then I didn't speak much French for the next couple of years, you know. So so I was, if I had my time back, I would be more in the immersive experience. Of course, it's much easier today with websites like Duolingo to stay current, right? But I didn't have that back in the 80s and 90s, right? So. So, yeah, there's yeah. a lot, a lot more, a lot of useful resources that anyone can reach, no matter where they live now. Yeah. But um, so, but yeah, a lot of those other things that sounds like uh, they they're serving you well. Like I know you're an English teacher as well. Like yeah, those other things that you studied. But uh, 
Yeah, I'd even like to spend like up to like over a year in a French speaking environment if I could. Um, that would really, that would greatly benefit you with your comprehension of the language and you would be yeah, so competent coming out of there, right? And uh, I think it that you would maintain that for a long time, even if you didn't speak much French, right? Yeah, you'd yeah. get uh, maybe even close to like a native level if... Um, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. But also too, I, when I was teaching French in Newfoundland, and I lived on the Buren Peninsula and I taught there, which is like about a half hour car ride to the ferry and then 45 minutes on the ferry to Saint Pierre. So I would often take my students from my school there over to Saint Pierre, like usually in the spring, it was a common practice. And that was really good for my students there to go actually go to France, like go in the morning, get like leave their town in the morning, get there in the afternoon then come back the next day, you know? So that was a, that was good for me too, to ha be able to take my students there and you know, let them see what was happening in, in a French environment, right? So. Yeah, I would have liked to be in your class. <laughs> yeah, that was, yeah, we had a lot of good trips, right? We went over on the ferry and uh, yeah, it was some days the sea was a little bit rough, but <laughs> we, we survived, right? <clears throat> um, so, uh, would you say for teaching French, like you would have preferred to like, you prefer in-person teaching or online teaching? Because in person you get to communicate a lot more with your students and you have, but like on online, you have a lot of uh, special like resources you can use. And it's probably like, um, yeah, there's a lot of convenience to it as well. But what would you say is <coughs> your favorite? Yeah, there, are, there are certain dynamics with the online that you can't have in the classroom. like. You can bring in a lot. Well, I guess you could bring in videos in the classroom too, but but yeah, so I, I like teaching online, but I think if I had my choice, I think I would be more effective as a teacher when I was standing in front of the students. You know, I could, you know, they could see me speaking and I could use more gestures. And, you know, yeah, I guess I can bring myself up in webcam, but, but I think it's learning a second language is probably, I don't know, better, but probably more easily done if, uh, if, if it's person like in person, right? Because you get to see the expressions of the teacher and you hear the, you know, and I, I don't know. I, I haven't, I haven't, um, I haven't taught French in the classroom in quite a while, right? So I've been here at this school for 12 years. So before that, right? So it's probably been about 15 years since I taught in the classroom for French. So, yeah, but uh, there's, there's a lot of advantages being face to face, right? Especially with immersion. I, I did teach in French immersion one year, about 15 years ago. And when my daughter was in grade seven, so I taught my daughter in grade seven French immersion, well, her class, right? And so that was, uh, that was a really good experience for me too, right? Like it's nice to be able to teach your own child. And, and then when I went to high school I taught grade 10 11 French in high school a couple of years after that and my son I was my son was in my classroom and it was core French but he had just come out of French immersion so his his French was better than his dad's really right <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm trying to teach my son but he he knew a lot more about it than I did right yeah. but what was nice I would ask my son like I'd ask my son to read something in the class to the to the rest of the students like read a passage and his friends his spoken french was so advanced that his core french students said wow like that's wow that's pretty good like you know he, his spoken french was better than mine the teacher so it was nice to have my son as a resource in the classroom in grade 10 and uh so talking about positive experiences with the language right but yeah but yeah so there, there are a lot of advantages to being face to face right you know yeah, I think I, I really took that for granted when I was in uh, elementary is um, how well that it was actually effective, like learning all my other subjects in French, like I'm learning my math in French, I'm doing social studies in French. Um, yes. So, and you don't, and it just becomes eventually, um, I, I got so tired of it, though, that um, because I didn't, I didn't really think it was anything special at the time, but now, like coming back to it when I, it was my own choice to re relearn this language, and I was actually very grateful for the time I, I spent there. And um, I, oh. I almost wish that I could be in a French immersion again because yeah. it was like, wow, I actually spoke pretty good back then. Like, 
Thank yeah, you. no, your, your French your French pronunciation is pretty good today too. Anytime you speak in class and or for assignments that you submit in French, you know, I can tell that you've got that immersion experience just by listening to you. Yeah. Yeah, even though I, I, I forgot a lot and I had to relearn it, I still think that a lot of things kind of carried over, like accent. Yeah. And um, just hearing my uh, my teacher was from Quebec, so um, yeah. I always heard her whenever I whenever she taught us, she'd, I'd get the accent into my head. And then when I speak, I would have it in my own speech. Although, uh, yeah, my accent has changed a little bit, but I think the pronunciation has, um, that helped a lot just to listen to it every day and speaking it all the time and having my teacher correct me. And, but yeah, um, I also yeah. really enjoy um, doing uh, online too, though, because, um, well, yeah, first of all, um, I like Duolingo. It's almost like, it's almost like playing a game. So it's nice to have that as part of your schoolwork. <laughs> but, um, yeah. Yeah. That's a pretty cool website. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so uh have you ever like done any reading in french like is that something that you really enjoy i've done not so i don't do a whole lot of it now but i have in the past especially when i was taking courses at university in saint john's i had to read things in french but but i i did that when i was living in quebec that summer i'd look at i'd read the french newspaper every almost every day and when I was living in France for a summer, I, I'd look through that too. So I was more immersed in it then. But I don't, of course, you can't go like anywhere you go in Okotoks, you're not, you're not going to pick up a French magazine, right? And or a newspaper. So now, of course, I can read all that online, I know, right? But, but I don't do that much of that today, you know, which I probably should be doing a little bit more. But, but uh, yeah, so I don't read a whole lot in French today. You know? Yeah. Um... Yeah, I, I recently read um, like Le Petit Prince in French, and I've also oh, oh nice. My, my friend Matteo, he, um, he's francophone or at least very close to it. His mom is, and um, like he lives here. So, and his dad is uh, anglophone, so he speaks a lot of both. But um, he's very good in French, yeah. and I actually interviewed him on the podcast as well. <laughs> but uh, oh, nice. he. Uh, he just gives me loads of books in French. Um, he gave me Harry Potter in French, uh, or let me borrow it. And okay. also there was this one interesting one. So, you know, those books where um, you have to, uh, so it's like this choose your own adventure books. And um, so if yeah, you make yeah. a certain decision, you have to flip through to a certain page. Well, I did one of those in French, yeah. which is really good for my comprehension because it's like, <laughs> I say them. Okay. Um, uh, it's really good for my comprehension because uh, I had to make decisions like I had to read it very carefully and I had to know what I wanted to do if I wanted to succeed in my quest. And then, you know, I had to yeah. be make uh, careful decisions and know exactly what the situation was. And um, so that was an interesting challenge, my comprehension and to actually make decisions and yeah. stuff. Um, but so yeah. anyways, uh, if you had um, one if you could give one piece of advice to uh, someone who wants to learn a uh, language, um, what would it be? Like, what you what you say is like the most important thing that's been that's helped you in your French? Like, what was the yeah? Would it be like immersion or a certain course that helped or? What well, excuse me? <clears throat> What's my best piece of advice? I would say to do what you're doing, like tune into the, the Francophone world, you know, as much as you can. Listen to French radio, listen to French podcasts, read newspapers online in French and uh, watch some TV programs in French, you know, because then you're hearing the native French speaker. You know, I know as a teacher, I need to do more of that myself so I can have my ear more in tune, especially for the accents. And so I would recommend any, any new student in French, I would recommend them more that you did that tuned into the francophone culture the quicker your comprehension and, and communication skills would improve right mm -hmm. yeah i feel like yeah. that that was the that was really the the point where my french just accelerated by like 30 times speed is when i realized that i could enjoy this and because yeah. a lot of that immersive stuff that's the most enjoyable thing because um yes. you know, you know, like native French speakers are, are listening to that stuff for entertainment and here you're doing it for education, right? 
yeah, and, yeah, that's true. And um, it just I found it accelerated my my French so fast, and then pretty soon I was talking with all my friends that speak French, and um, like they yeah. were saying, um, "Wow, like it's really good." And I was like, "Well, I just listen to a lot of stuff, and I don't even speak a lot. Like I, I do as much as I can, but um, yeah, it's a lot of listening mostly." Um, yeah, and then, then you're 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 kind of taking it all in, then, right? And you're building on your knowledge base, you're increasing your, vo your vocabulary, so it's all good, right? And especially this day and age, with with uh, so much out, out there on the internet, that is just really unlimited, almost, right? So, yeah, and I'd like some so from time to time, I'll look at French teacher blogs. There's a few that I pay close close attention to. Teachers in the states, teachers in Canada that are you know doing what i'm doing so i'm i'm i'm, I'm kind of trying to stay current with that too right so these are teachers in like quebec or down in the states right yeah 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 so um so you've written quite a few books i i actually read one of them um mm -hmm. confidence in the game of life i think that's okay. your newest one yeah um have you ever taken on any kind of writing challenge in french uh, hmm. Yeah, I, I did actually a few, like probably uh, maybe 15 years ago or more. I, I tried my hand at writing some French poetry back then and uh, just toying around with it. And, uh, but I, I never really kept it up. And then I just got away from it and then started writing poetry in English, right? Yeah. It's much more comfortable there, right? And, uh, but that was probably my only attempt at writing in the language and other than doing assignments at university, of course, you know, but yeah, that, I do recall that, yeah, probably close to 20 years ago, just dabbling in that, right? And, uh, and just yeah. writing a couple of poems, just to see what I could do with it, just to challenge myself. And this is just something different to do, right? So, yeah. yeah, I actually did uh, almost the same thing, but um, when, when I, uh, when I originally uh, found, heard about you doing your challenge about to write 60 poems in 60 days for your uh, latest book, um, yeah. I actually decided to do the same thing. If you, if you remember in creative writing class, I wanted yes. to submit um, my 60 poems in French. Yes. So I did do that challenge, um, yeah. but oh, I, my English poems are much better as you can probably imagine because it's... No, that that was a great project you did, right? In creative writing. Just looking back and reading through it, it was just about like getting it, like being able to do it because the poems themselves are like, they need some editing. The grammar is questionable. And um, just, but, just to put yourself out there and do that, right? That, that was, that's quite an accomplishment, right? So, yeah, that helped a lot because it added a routine, like daily aspect to yeah. doing something in French. But, yeah, and I, I found the same with writing those poems. like. As I got into it, like day 15, day 20, day 35, oh, they were coming a little bit faster for me, right? You know, and uh, but the first four or five days, I went, oh, okay, what am I going to say, right? <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, but it's that discipline that you mentioned, right? That's really helpful. Yeah, so yeah, really kind of what you said about raising the bar in your introduction of your of your book. It's yeah, yeah, you know, but... picking another challenge that's gonna just like yeah, it's just a little bit a, higher. Yeah. yeah, not just write a poem in every day for sixty days, but to write it in ten minutes or less, right? Yeah, that was a that was a challenge, especially when I was traveling. Like this time last year, early December, I flew back to Newfoundland for my mom's birthday, and but I was I still uh, disciplined myself to write the poem from the hotel I was staying in that morning, and because I, I wanted to fit, I was so close. I was at number forty eight or whatever, right? So. <laughs> I, yeah. uh, I wanted to finish the goal, right? And uh, I, like you said, raised the bar, right? Yeah. yeah, it's a lot easier to keep going when you get closer to the end, or at least yeah. you have more determination. Yeah, yeah that's right. And uh, and then going back, like when, before I published it last spring, you know, yeah, I had to tweak a couple of words here and there, right? You know, just to make sure I, it was where I wanted it to be, you know? So. Um, Good. But, uh, yeah, so um, thank you so much for... Uh, appearing on the podcast it's been uh, i think over 20 minutes now but um it's, it's been really fun yeah so uh, but yeah see you in class i guess on monday see you in class on monday uh, for sure judah and good luck with your podcast and how do i how do i uh, get access to your podcast 
Um, it's on Spotify, Apple Podcasts. It's on a lot of things. Google Podcasts, I think. Um, oh. So just search up Mind Palace Languages. So Mind that's, Palace? yeah, that's oh. what I, it, it was formerly called French for Real. But okay. uh, then I renamed it to incorporate more languages. So now it's Mind Palace Languages. So I can okay. share a little bit of German and Hebrew. So oh, that should cool. be interesting. Um but yeah, thanks again and uh, à la prochaine. <laughs>